So Jeff's passing out a, a handout. I'll reference that uh, a little further into the presentation. It's really just informational. Um, this is a good summary of the school budget presentation that uh, they went through yesterday. This is some of their direct materials. And we're going to talk about that uh, throughout the presentation. So you don't need to look at it too much right now. Um, you know, it's January, so we are excited to kick off your FY25 budget process. I'm going to walk you through. This is kind of a high-level treatment of a variety of topics. Um, we get back in it. The last slide is kind of going through the actual schedule for the full season, but this gives you a, you know, sort of a, a taste of, of all the things that are going on. Um, we'll start with the kind of the economic backdrop. I think that's really important, particularly as you all consider revenues and those sources, and we've got some good updates there. And we'll talk a little bit about just sort of the formation on the county side in terms of our operating capital budgets. Um, again, highlights of schools. They just presented uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon. You've seen some of that information. Uh, spent a little bit more time here probably on school capital. That's It's still very, very early in that conversation as far as the new school board coming in. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on more today is sort of the stratus piece of that. So we've got sort of those updated projections and where we think those pressures are going to come from. And then we spent a little bit more time here overlaying the plans that are embedded in the referendum uh, that's already in motion and maybe some of those supplemental pieces. You all talked about this topic at your retreat this afternoon, so very timely there. And then again, we'll, we'll wrap up with sort of the calendar, walk through the process for the rest of the season. So um, with that being said, the first and biggest piece of your revenue puzzle is obviously your real property update. Um, you see here, this is a nice chart that the, the budget folks put together. Overall, it's about a 9.7% increase on the total portfolio. Very, very much in line with what we saw last year. Uh, the, the highest and, and f most focus comes on this box right here. Reval on existing residential, 8.9 this year, 8.8 .8 last year. Uh, so that's an average figure. So again, you're going to see highs and lows and the assessment notices are going out. You've all had your meeting. Uh, with the assessment team. So you've kind of got your background and your, your specifics there. Very, very similar experience to last year. Again, those assessment notices go out on the new growth side. So that's new product actually on the ground. Uh, you know, a healthy increase there, but we did see it fall off from last year. And that, that's consistent with what we've been saying, you know, for quite some time now. We've seen sort of that development, um, you know, where it shot up a couple of years ago, kind of coming back to more uh, long run averages. So a nice contribution there, but certainly nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, new growth on the commercial side, 265 million. That was an increase from uh, the, the prior year. And then commercial revaluation, about a 5% increase. That varies greatly across commercial properties. Uh, but you did see no matter which, where you look in the book, you have a nice and you know what we consider to be a you know pretty healthy increase. We don't think that the reval on existing residential is something that We'll continue to see um, all of our budgetary assumptions when we talk about that with you all. You know, we're taking that back to somewhere in the three and a half to four percent, kind of that steady state. So we are not building budgets on on these results. Uh, but at the same time, we don't think that there's a bubble that has necessarily formed like we saw, you know, back in the 08 to 12. So this is, you know, sort of your, your main your three legs of your revenue stool. This is the biggest one. It's healthy. It's contributing to the bottom line for sure. Your second biggest one, though, is vehicles, real property. Um, this has been a wild ride because of COVID and all the other pieces and parts that go along with that. You see here, the, and this is not our data. Um, we're working closely with the commissioner. She is using national information to run our specific book of vehicles right now. That happens really in February. She's been able to give us some preliminary insights into that we appreciate uh, that partnership with her but what we know is regardless of what you look at again this is a, a national set of statistics you see it broken down by particular types of automobiles over there but we are in this phase over here so what we are expecting i don't have the final numbers for you today but that personal property not real property but personal property vehicles that whole suite of of revenues is going to be lower than it was uh, last tax year. That might be somewhere, anywhere between six and 12%, depending on what exactly, what type of vehicle you're looking at. There certainly were some large run-ups over the course of the last 
two to three years. We saw a lot of that given back last year. It looks like that uh, activity has not stopped. And so we do expect uh, personal property to be a, a negative, a, a red number when we look at our overall revenue mix. So houses doing well, vehicles still working through and processing uh, some of the bubbles from the, the prior year. This is a dominant topic when we look at not only on the revenue side, but more so for us on the expense side. You see here inflation, uh, core and regular inflation. It, it's come back down to, you know, 4%, which is good. You know, you see a very, very flat experience there for a long time, right around the 2%. So it's moderated back to 4%. So, you know, that that's better than it was. But I think this is where it really hits us. This is a uh, an in Part of an article that we found this week, it shows the inflationary experience for all these categories. Mr. Engel, I'm sure you can uh, opine on this, but since February of 2020, since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's you know all these construction categories ranging from plus 30 to plus 60 percent, and so I think what you're going to see, school CIP, county CIP, a lot of the projects we've already got in motion are still digesting these numbers on the right hand side. We are seeing some day-to-day -day inflationary things come back to earth, uh, but this is still going to be a topic that we're going to have to deal with, again, particularly on the capital side, and you'll see that when we get uh, further into February and March. Another look at CPI, again, has come back down 2% for a very long time, better part of 15 or 20 years. Uh, what you're looking at here is wages plotted on top of CPI, so it has moderated, but it's really just kind of caught up uh, with wage growth, both sitting here in this particular chart, right around 4% year over year growth. So while it's come back down, uh, the average wage increase is basically being, you know, given away to those inflationary pressures. So, you know, inflation, again, not, not going away anytime soon. What that's more or less done is created sort of a weary consumer. Uh, you see here, these are delinquencies on auto and credit cards, these two green lines, the dotted line is 100% meaning that if it's above that, we're seeing an increase. Again, these are not Chesterfield stats, but these are the kinds of things that we keep very close eye on. And what we're seeing is because of those consistent inflationary pressures, just more reliance on some of these you know, types of instruments to uh, pay for stuff at the household level, particularly on the credit cards. And so we saw those balances rising last year. And now we're seeing those delinquencies starting to follow. So again, the consumer, the prolonged exposure to that inflationary environment starting to take its toll nationally. Consumer spending locally. Again, you see this is you know sort of that COVID period of time. It was an unprecedented run of basically double digit growth year over year, month after month. We've come out of the COVID period and you know, overall, if you average this out, still pretty good, still higher probably than our long run average, but it's become very sporadic, uh, very up and down. And so it's much harder for us to predict and count on. So of our three big revenue sources, and really just sort of the simple message I want you to take away, real property doing fine, uh, strong increases there. Uh, and we've talked about, I think one of the things that we pointed out, we met with all of you, and this wasn't the case kind of coming out of the Great Recession, all five districts, the average experience is pretty consistent. I think that's a real testament to uh, the county's collective focus to make sure we don't have sort of a east and west divide from a real property, you know, appreciation perspective, very consistent results countywide. So that, that's, that's a positive thing. So that, that leg of the stool is doing fine. The consumer's starting to get a little bit wary. So for us, sales tax, something we can't lean on quite as much perhaps, and then uh, personal property, the vehicles, you know, that we expect that to be a negative when we add all this together. So it's a it's a mixed bag from a revenue perspective. So going over to, we, sorry, yes, sir, you can stop. Do think that uh, with new sales that that will make up for some of the loss to make it more even, or do we think we're going to end up in the negative even with new vehicles coming in? Uh, I think that we will. We still have a very strong chance of being you know in in the red overall i mean certainly we're adding population and that helps and people are turning old vehicles in for new but you know it's kind of like that topic on real property is that if that assessment number goes down it doesn't 
there's you can't add enough inventory to to overcome that. It's the same phenomenon basically in place on personal property. So just some again transitioning into our side of the budget process. So we you know we began this in the fall. We've got all the submissions in from departments. We started to have those conversations with you. Um, you know, not going to go into any great detail here, but you know, we've got a healthy set of requests on the capital front and the operating front. We got 93 CIP requests totaling about 821 million dollars. We're working through that process now to identify and prioritize those. And again, on both of these fronts, we are going to budget not just in 25, but all the way out to 29 and beyond. So we are working through this process now. Um, yeah, the parallel for schools, you know, there's 17 million dollars on that second or third page of things that they would like to incorporate into this budget, and we will continue to work with them. We'll go into more detail that in a second, but suffice to say, same story here. The amount of requests that come in always outstrip, you know, the resources that are available. Uh, the process really is trying to figure out what's the priority order for that, and then again, how can you plan for stuff in the out year. So we are going through this process right now. And uh, again, that will be before you in great detail uh, in early March when the county administrator presents his budget. Well, what are those key priorities? And these are really going to be the big themes for us. Um, education, making sure that we, again, thought that was a, certainly a, an emergent theme or a consistent theme from y'all's discussion this afternoon. We were plus $20 million in our local increase last year. That was the all-time high. And then we have matched that in our preliminary discussions, and you saw that uh, in the superintendent's proposal yesterday. So that's that's the top line figure. Uh, the employee, making sure that we are investing in them. And I think the way that it's described up here is the total employee is, is a very important one. You all have built some very nice pay plans on county side and school side. So it's not necessarily a new pay plan or adding on to that, but it's really about maintaining and, and keeping the promises that we've set forth the last couple of years paying attention to health care, paying attention to other supports that we might be able to install throughout the organization that support uh, the workforce. So that, that continues to be very important. And then the merit piece, you know, for the general population, 4% inflation over a sustained period. We are 3.5%. That's what's going to go into their checks on February the 9th. You know, how do we maintain and try to keep something at least 35 to 4% to at least, you know, keep, keep tabs with inflation? Facilities, infrastructure has been a huge emphasis, going to continue to be. It's really less about new projects uh, versus continuing to move and make progress on those that have already been established. And then really looking at those project gaps. We know that's going to happen. Uh, some of the bids are coming in and we're trying to keep on top of that. So that, that will be a major, major point of emphasis, not only in your budget process, but you all have used other opportunities at year end. Uh, and after you get through the audit to make sure that these accounts and this stuff, this work that's already in flight is shored up. And then lastly, uh, the audit finance team, watch for live Mr. Holland, uh, financial policies. This is our year to go through there and, and take a look at that. This will have a financial impact as we ratchet up those ratios and making sure, particularly if we're going to be heavily invested here in the infrastructure space, we need to make sure that our debt policies are equally responsible and so that uh, that work is underway and that will be you know another big theme for for this budget CIP again I you know we will show you this uh, in further detail in February and then again in March there's not going to be any major surprises it is the execution of the referendum fortunately we were able to get out there and combine some years of projects. Everything on the far side of this slide is things that we've already sold. And uh, you know, Mr. Bowles and his team, and the rest of the capital project project folks are well underway on those. This is what's remaining. And I think you know, you know the projects that are on here from a referendum perspective. But what we are uh, bringing forth this year is the timing and the sequencing, doing that a little bit differently. So we would have a sale this year in 25, take off in 26, sell in 27, take off 28, and then sell the final piece of that uh, in 29. That allows us you know, a better path to getting those executed and helps us to space out the debt service a little bit. So we can have plenty of conversation about the which column each project you know, ultimately lands in, but I think the timing, the rhythm of the CIP is really sort of all that we have decided 
uh, thus far. I think you do have some opportunities to advance some projects, but as long as they sort of fall in that every other year pattern. Uh, again, we'll put this out for the community. This is more meant for a community update slide. You know these. These. This is more detail on that far side, what's already in motion from our uh, referendum, but we are certainly uh, very proud of the fact that you know, we got that authority in, in November of 22, and you know, here we are just a little over a year later, and we are making major progress on the first two pieces of the referendum. Any questions before I transition over to schools? Comments, supervisors, questions? Yes. It's just a quick, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question. Um, me being the advocate for Midlothian, of course, um, can you give me a sense of where Midlothian Middle School falls on this? Yeah, you, it's coming up in just one second. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're getting there. So, uh, again, process wise, those of you who have done this before, you know it's, it's a little bit strange. Schools has to go first, governor's budget comes out right before Christmas. Uh, you know, the superintendent has less than a month essentially to take that and incorporate. And he he presented his proposed budget to the school board uh, yesterday. So that's what I'm going to key off on on the capital side and on the operational side. It's really passes that ball to the school board now. And they've got 30 days, more or less, before they have to submit that to the county administrator by by March the first. So that's what you're looking at. Before we get into the specifics of it, and if you listened to any of it yesterday or Looked at any of the coverage except for Channel 8, who, who doesn't really pay attention to the details, unfortunately. Fortunately, you would have seen, you know, really was a tremendous spirit of collaboration between county and schools. And again, I, I thought y'all's conversation this afternoon was very, very timely in that respect. You know, I've been doing this since my first budget was FY09, and you know, I've never seen the kind of you know collaboration. And it's it's been stretched back probably six months really building for those folks have been you know really really good we talk you know almost on a daily basis and I think if you if you go and you'll listen to the work session or even review the paper and the language and the way it's presented it's very very deliberate on their part and I think it does set that tone Mr. Engel you had a nice commentary on that this afternoon but uh, you know bravo to them for a really nice rollout and I think it, it sets it up for a, a much more uh, collaborative process as we move through the rest of February and March. So this is their operational budget in a nutshell. Um, again, they've just got the governor's, in fairness to the, to the state, they've just got the governor's proposed budget. They don't have any, any actions or any ideas from the General Assembly, but it's a $14.5 million dollar increase. Uh, that's a sharp drop off from the prior year. Uh, the JLARC pieces and all the, the topics that you all have been discussing for some period of time, right beside the school board and really throughout the region there's no trace of any of that in uh, in the proposed budget that's out there right now fortunately like i mentioned uh, the county commitment we maintain that t plus 20 million dollar level uh, and you know i really can't thank them enough too the, the we have shared services that we do with schools a whole wide range of things uh, that bill was due to go up three million dollars knowing what the state had in store here and once we got to look at that we told them that you know, we would hold the line and basically keep the, the cost of those shared services at its current level. So that was a $3 million cost avoidance. Uh, and, and the schools went through that in detail. I really do appreciate them spending the time doing that. So you see here. And, and what this see now it's really working uh, with the superintendent it's not shown in there they are hoping that that's converted to more uh, flexible compensation dollars ultimately but there's not there is no raise in the state's budget for education that was presented by the governor no raise nothing um, so Matt, what was yes a, sir what was the governor's proposed budget last year for education 14.5 this May this year what was the last year? I think it's roughly double that total uh, a year ago. Oh, so it, okay. it, it 
you know, certainly a, a scaled back version of that. A drop, in yeah. essence. So good news here and good news here. I know this has been a, a collective priority of both boards. One-time money. They do have a $6 million reduction there. Um, so it, it's, it's balanced, uh, as you have in front of you at our 20 and being able to pull the six out. You know, that's something that we can evaluate depending on what happens at the state level. But I think as a starting place, that's a really, really good accomplishment. That has them at a $10 million use of, of non-recurring revenues. I think that's a sustainable and safe level. So certainly, certainly a lot to be uh, happy about in what was shown yesterday. It was proposed as a balanced budget. And that's the paper that you have before you. And it delineates very, very specifically what's in there. There's a 4% merit increase. Again, that's fully shouldered by the locals because of you know the way that the, the governor's proposal is, is currently set up. It would match, and we would hope to match that when the county administrator's proposed budget comes out in March. So there is compensation, but again, it's just all on the local dollar. And you see the other pieces and parts. No real major initiatives, again, shoring up things that they have in motion, trying to deal with some of the inflationary pressures, uh, but a really nice way that this is done. So that balances that, that number, and that then the superintendent shows other considerations if additional dollars show up. That's the $17 million list. You see that broken out. I think it's a very you know manageable list. Some of the things in there, like additional monies for major maintenance, those are things we could do at year end. This board has a very, very strong track record of investing in those at those other opportunities, uh, but you see it there in, in detail. So as monies become available locally, state, whatever it is, you know we've got the list in hand, and that makes for a very, very transparent and uh, easy process. So that's a, I hope that is the model moving forward for sure. This is the, you know, Dr. Miller. To your point, this is the uh, current snapshot of the school CIP that was presented yesterday. You know, in, in fairness to the school staff, a brand new school board coming in, they have not had the time to work through this. So I, I would describe this to you as a starting point only. I think this is going to move around quite a bit, um, but you do see here broken out really between renovations and new construction, and then you see the totals across the bottom. Uh, you know, we certainly have given some feedback um, to schools. This probably needs to be elongated out in terms of the way that they want to do this. You've got very little activity from a debt perspective in 28 or 29. So I think there's going to be a lot of movement on this window. Again, our referendum wraps up in 29. Uh, there's, you know, we would schedule and hope to do the same way, but I wouldn't get overly excited about the relative ordering of this. I think schools would say, again, this is just a starting point. It's really just sort of a board of all of the eligible projects. And you know the, the conversation will you know move forward as to which one comes when. Uh, you do see, Mr. Holland, the New Dale Elementary is lifted. It's not a referendum project. You know We're working to figure out how we would uh, debt finance that. There's another new old 100 elementary school in here, not a referendum project. Those are capacity considerations. Uh, the Midlothian project is sitting there in FY26 and FY27 currently. But again, this is a starting point. This will be a ongoing conversation all the way up until April, I would assume. So any questions on this listing? All I would tell you on this, if you want to make sure you see your project on the list, again, where, where it sits right now is not something that I would spend a whole lot of time worrying about. So I think one of the factors that will sort of inform that conversation is, again, how does the, the Stratus model look at this and where are those pressures going to be? Again, it's not the end all be all, but it is a nice tool in the toolkit. Uh, there's lots of considerations that go into that, that discussion. Um, just for those of you that are a little bit newer to it, again, it's an active platform. We are using this in a variety of areas now. We've kind of rolled it out into the library and parks and fire space because it has a wealth of, it's really just built on a wealth of data and how you can, you can employ that across a variety of disciplines. It's not just for schools. This is the fifth time we've done a school forecast. And, and again, just, just for a little background, we're looking five years out. Stratus doesn't 
necessarily look at one year to year. Schools has other cohort survival. They have other methods that they use to try to project enrollment for next fall. How many teachers will they need? All those different things. Two really different conversations. Stratus is really looking, again, where are students likely to be generated from in the future? Really a capital discussion. Doesn't have a whole lot of operating uh, impact or application. There are other means to do that. Uh, right now, the current run of that is looking at, you know, 64,500, give or take, students for the 28-29 school year. And this is stripping off some of the academies and governor schools. This is really just looking at pre-K through 12 in our buildings. There's virtual. There's a lot of other categories that would make that number higher. There's certainly a, a higher customer base for Chesterfield County schools, but from a physical plant perspective, that's what Stratus is looking at. Where you know seats for students that are coming in. There's lots of other ways services are delivered. So just want to delineate that. But that's a relatively subdued growth pattern uh, between here and 28, 29. It's not you know out of uh, what we've seen. It, it over five year stretches over the last little while, but that's about a 1,700 student increase over that five-year period. So, you know, again, seeing some sort of normalization in terms of, uh, of student growth, which is certainly a good thing from a capital perspective. So this is what I'm gonna show you the next few slides. These are the new numbers. They are up on the county website. Everything I'm showing you here is publicly available and you can go in there and drill down uh, and take a look at it on your own time for those that are following at home. So, let me just orient you to each one of these slides. So this, what you're seeing on the map piece is what Stratus is projecting for 28, 29. It's unadjusted for capital strategies. It doesn't take that into consideration. It just says, for what we know now, existing boundaries, where are those pressure points gonna be in 28, 29? So your referendum is not incorporated in here. Um, but we do show it here. So this is what scheduled new seats at the elementary level over the next how many ever years. We don't have timelines on here because we just showed you on the CIP snapshot. Those aren't firmly uh, entrenched. But what I want to show you on each one is where we've got pressure points that we are expecting by that time. Do we have a capital strategy somewhere on the plan? And I think in most every case over these three slides, you will see that we do. So that, that's really what I kind of want to walk through. As you can see, green suggests you've got capacity. The darker orange, red are the areas, the pockets where we are expecting to have capacity constraints, you know, looking five years forward. Or in a lot of cases, we have those now. We, we know where a lot of those places are. So here you see kind of the, the cluster of capacity discussions is right here, sort of in the heart of the Dale District, a little piece of Bermuda. But we do have the New Dale Elementary School is shown in the plan. Uh, that's why it has emerged, even though it wasn't a referendum project, because the data absolutely makes a strong case for that. Uh, you know, we got a Western Area Middle School here in the Mosley area. There's a new Old 100 reliever up there in the northern part of the county. So if you look at elementary level overall, pretty good, you know, 91% capacity utilization right now. So you've got plenty of capacity. You can't move it all around. You can't redistrict your way out of all of these things. So you do have a variety of uh, ways that we are planning to deal, particularly with that central piece, including uh, A.M. Davis up at the top is another one that's you know 200 seats. All in all, 3,500 seats of additional elementary capacity is what is somewhere in that CIP matrix that we just walked through. So. If you execute all those capital strategies, I would uh, make the argument that you really are in a very, very good place in terms of elementary school capacity. By the time you get out to 28, 29, that map is gonna look considerably different. Same setup at the middle school level. Again, but you got 2,600 planned seats, Fallen Creek at 648, Midlothian 400, and then a new Western Area Middle School at 1800. So that largely deals with the Tomahawk and Bailey Bridge. Uh, Fallen Creek will get its own additional capacity, and then you get a little bit of relief up there in the northern portion. So 
again, you got about a 96% capacity utilization currently at the middle school level. Uh, it's that's the highest we've seen that bubble kind of working its way through over the course of the last 10 years. So it totally makes sense. Uh, but you do again have relief on the way. 2,600 students or 2,600 seats uh, scheduled to be added in over the course of the next you know five years, give or take. High school level, no surprises here. Uh, the largest capacity constraint that we would project. It's already there, Cosby High School, but you, you know, working now on your Western Area High School with 2,400 seats, uh, that does leave the Meadowbrook um, issue on the table. That is something that will have to be discussed. But I think the good news there is, you know, schools have been talking for a good while. As when this comes on line, there's a chance to redistrict high schools across the county, and that's a very good opportunity to deal with some of those high school issues that you have uh, more on the eastern side. So there's not a second high school necessarily, but there will be a unique opportunity to take a look at that. High school utilization today, somewhere around 94%. So we do have some capacity uh, countywide. So all in all, all of those reds and orange and even a lot of the yellow are all lined up very, very well. In your CIP, there's some work to do for the relative ordering of those projects, but I don't think there's any glaring holes in what the superintendents proposed from a CIP perspective. The referendum, really the two topics are the old Hunter reliever, the Dale reliever. We're working very closely to figure out how we can finance those and get those embedded into the capital lineup over the next five years. So all in all, a, a very, very positive report, I think, on, on school facilities. How does that look um, from a macro perspective? Again, I think the, the number to focus in on is right here. If all of those things, all of those seats were put into place, now this doesn't have a, a growth assumption in it, but Stratus is you know, projecting against relatively subdued growth. You'd have 85% plus or minus. This isn't, you know, don't lock into the point three necessarily, but plenty of capacity if you execute 8,500 additional seats spread across all levels. If you can execute the referendum plus the other two projects and have a period of subdued growth, I think you're going to see a system that has a, an adequate level of capacity left in it and not, you know, stressed out in any particular place. So the snapshot as we stand here today can always change. It has in the past, but it's, it's, a, it's a bright picture, I, I would suggest, for, for school facilities. Any questions on any of that? Can you define for me subdued growth? Yeah, so I mean, the, the model is looking at you know seventeen to eighteen hundred students over the five years of so it, where it's it's total for those particular categories. I'm talking pre-K through twelve, through twenty-eight, twenty-nine, seventeen to eighteen hundred students. That's right around three percent growth over that period of time. And again, we we looked back at various five-year stretches in the last you know ten to twenty years. That, that is absolutely in line with you know experiences that we've seen over five year stretches. Now we've had years where it was 1,500 in a year, but some of that recent noise has really just been, it's kind of like the car values. It went down 1,500 in the COVID year, it comes back the next year. That's not a real reflection of 1,500 new students you know, being created from a housing pipeline. It's really just sort of this noise in the series because of other events. So, you know, again, it's, I think that 17 to 1800 student path is, is, is certainly a, a very realistic one. We work very closely with schools uh, on all those assumptions and we continue to run the model, you know, every single year. But I think where we stand right now, that's, uh, and what we're seeing from housing permits and all the other items, I think that is a, a reasonable, you know, land in terms of the analysis. And I think I'll just skip ahead because I can sense a question brewing in you. Um, so this is another part of strategy that we haven't talked about quite as much, but these are student generation factors. We update this every single year as we run the model and we look at this is real empirical data. So this isn't even, you know, doing any forecasting. Student generation counts by these five housing types. And then you see the totals on the bottom. And then this really is 
new product is coming on and you are considering zoning decisions and all the other things that, that happen in the community development space, when we, you get those reports, it's based on these real student generation factors from real results that we have on the ground. And just to summarize for you, single family on average, about half a student per unit. And you can see how that impacts each of the levels of the school division. Multifamily at 0.34, uh, condos, you know, very, very little, townhome at less than 0.3 students per, per unit. And we've got this broken out. I think Dr. Casey may have shared it with you. If he has, and we certainly can, we do have it broken out by each individual school um, and each individual housing type at each individual school. So we can really go in and triangulate. We have a zoning case come in. We're not even using these countywide averages. We're using something very specific to the geographies that are in play. But this is how it blends out over the entire entirety of the county. Can you explain why mobile homes are by almost 100%? Uh, so yeah, that, I mean that's a almost a student per per unit is what is what that would be, and you know we just do see a, a higher generation there, but there's certainly a lot less of them. But that is one of the categories that we track. Dr. Casey, so uh, yes, Mr. Harris referred to that this is just a, a summary of the data, and, and we didn't want to overwhelm you with a, a worksheet that had, you know, if you think about it, each and every school with you know five or six columns. So this is just a precursor to what will otherwise be the underlying detail that, that his office is willing to share. We're working closely with the school. So this isn't quote unquote county data, this is county and school uh, factual data. But it does lend itself to, to the uh, perennial question in, in, in observation of sc how school redistricting, as you approach that topic as a school board, again, has the powers to approach that topic, how critical and important it is to know the underlying data. And, and I'll just refer to one example. If you look at the high school uh, column of the point uh, one six overall, I mean, that you see, I'm, so, or I'm sorry, if you add up all the factors there, but generally, like uh, Cosby High School has point two high school students on average for all the different households that comprise the Cosby School District. The lowest high school district has point one students. So the differential is 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 large meaning that if, if the dip, you know a point two to point one for cosby high school is is equal to 1000 students so if cosby high school's district had the same geographic proportions as another high school district in the county it would have 1000 less students and it wouldn't be that crowding issue that you sense today each and every school has its own story and i think that's what we want to try and do is be honest and forthcoming and transparent and bring that to light are there capacities in other places of the county because of underlying demographics that have less density per household uh, than others? The answer is yes. Are there areas that have higher? The answer is also yes. We've tried to do our best through zoning cases, as, as Mr. Harris referred to, much better than we have done years ago, where we presented overall statistics that were breaking it down by the type of housing. So when you have the type of zoning case and the type of geographic district, you're getting the most representative product and then yield. And, and, and Dr. Kisra, you could see kind of we, from a design perspective, we didn't want to overwhelm you with the eye chart, but you see all the details under here, and we certainly will get that to you. And just, again, this is real data it's tied to the student address files. Uh, we get that, you know, to share with us with schools. It helps us present this. None of that level detail is available, but it is based on the exact students that are in our schools today. So again, this isn't asking some, asking a, a builder or whatever. It is based on the exact uh, population makeup of our of our current division so it's very very up-to-date and accurate information and, and just to, uh, Matt didn't overlay my Cosby example just by chance so I didn't rehearse this but the right below what he's in, in, embedded in there you see Cosby High School is the first thing as the next line and again we're going to share this out but if you go all the way to the far right hand side Cosby High School has 2,757 students that's a lot of students and it also has a point two uh, students per household ratio, which is the highest high school ratio in the county. If you go slowly down, it doesn't cover all the high schools, but you see, you know, if, if they're in the point one range, in essence, easy math is you would divide that student population in essence in half. So the 2700, if it had a point one factor, it would have, you know, uh, you know, half the amount of students of 2700. Yeah, so that's the way to 
to work this model. So the question is, as if this is what we know in trends, and again, we have a reliever high school also going into that district too. So that's, that's, that's another variable to add. And, and as Mr. Harris mentioned, we have a new rebuilds that are also providing additional capacities. All of those variables going together. And what's not included, at least for high schools, uh, and it should always be known, is that the career and technical centers, uh, they, all those students there, have a home high school that's embedded in the high school count, even though they may not necessarily be at their home high schools during the day. So how those factors uh, derive as far as concentration of students all day at a high school is, is another fair variable to, to discuss. Any other questions on this topic? Go, Mr. Amy. <coughs> I would ask if you could get us some data on the um, multifamily that has come out in the last four years versus the multifamily that is older than that. Because with the new trends, in multifamily cutting down three bedroom units and not having any four bedroom units. We've seen a significant decrease in the number of students generated from new um, multifamily projects that I don't believe the citizens understand. They look at it and expect it to generate what previous multifamily has. So I, I'd just like to get that data um, so we can sit it side by side to know that we're looking at 0.34 there, but if you actually look at the new projects, I believe they'll actually come in within the last yep. four years. They're going to come in significantly We're lower than the 0.34 because those have a lot of four-bedroom units that are older legacy multifamily throughout the county. Yeah, so we, 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 we're happy to update that. We did that analysis you know, several years ago, and it, it, it proved exactly what you're saying. The, the older, larger units are, are the heavier student producers. But yeah, we're, we're happy to take a fresh look at that. Yeah, and, and Mr. Engel, if I could echo that too, um, because the underlying data is actually uh, addresses from where the student comes from, I think we could actually even help understand one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom of the entire inventory as far as the yields of student per household in four bedroom, you know, so that you would see not just the newer units, but the entire database by geographic school district. I just think that's important as we analyze cases in the future um, that we have that information so we can make accurate decisions. Other questions, concerns? Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, uh, no, last one's the easy one. Uh, our next major time that we're in front of you will be in February. We'll come back with a little more detail on, on all of these topics. You, schools will be getting closer to adopting their budget. They actually start their community town halls tonight uh, at Meadowbrook High School. We will have staff there. Again, we're covering those collaboratively with uh, with schools. So they'll start getting some feedback tonight. Again, the real estate assessment notices are, are going out this week. Your budget work session is on in this room on March the 13th. And then two weeks later, your public hearings on the 25 budget. Uh, and we have Susan Wilson, I know, and, and that team is working to schedule your town halls now. So we try to do those generally between the, the work session and the public hearings. And then we culminate uh, budget adoption on April the 10th. So those are the major milestones. Lots of other information on here. Again, we put this on the website. And uh, we are also working with communications and media, put out a, a blog on a lot of this information and really drill down into some of these uh, school facility topics that I know of our interest to uh, to many of your constituents. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it.